Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Justin Brown and the entire MGH Paralysis Center team for inviting me to do this uh, talk on spasticity. And uh, without further ado, we're going to talk about the management of spasticity and uh, what's new in 1913. And that's meant to be a provocative title, as you'll see. What common conditions lead to spasticity? Stroke, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, transverse myelitis, and cerebral palsy. And what is spasticity? Well, spasticity is nothing more than loss of the inhibition of primarily the gamma motor neuron reflex arc by the upper motor neuron. The upper motor neurons quiet the reflex arc and the antagonist muscles during contraction of the agonist muscle. Loss of this inhibition results in reflex contracture of the antagonist muscle, resulting in co-contraction during joint movement. So what does that mean? It means that muscles don't really fire out of phase unless they're spastic, and they really fire in response to the stretch that they're getting. Therefore, you'll see on an EMG, for example, activity of the FCU with wrist extension, and we call that that the muscle is firing out of phase, but it's not really firing on its own volition. So to understand spasticity, you need to understand the gamma motor neuron circuit. Spindle fibers within the muscle sense stretch. There are alpha and gamma motor fibers that fire at the same time, tightening the spindle fibers that are proportional to the rest of the muscle. We call that alpha and gamma coactivation. And that means that the spindle fibers and the regular muscle fibers are all contracting in the same rate at the same time. There is a gamma bias in that gamma fibers have a lower threshold to fire and that requires upper motor neuron suppression. The cerebellum maintains the alpha gamma linkage and allows those to fire in concert. Resting tension or tone of a muscle is controlled by the gamma motor neuron firing via the 1A afferents activating the alpha motor neurons. Our experience overall as surgeons with spasticity is pretty limited. There are a few surgeons that treat spasticity on a regular basis and the focus is on contracture management really. Cerebral palsy, for example, is managed by physiatrists and pediatric orthopedists who concentrate on the lower extremity. Stroke is managed by neurosurgeons acutely and neurologists in the subacute phase and physiatrists in the long term. Traumatic brain injury, transverse myelitis, spinal cord injury, for example, are managed by neurologists primarily in the acute setting and then subacute phase and then physiatrists in the long term. So the referral pattern looks something like this with physiatrists really at the hub. But physiatrists don't often refer to surgeons. Why? Well, there's the ongoing Botox, which may provide a profit motive. We generally don't publish in their journals, so they don't really have any idea of what we're doing. And there's no history of collaboration. There are very few centers where there are surgeons and physiatrists working together. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have that situation, but that's not always the case. And there's also a lack of a critical mass of research that really pushes this idea that surgery can be beneficial to patients. Here's one such study where tendon transfer surgery in the upper extremity cerebral palsy is more effective than botulinum toxin injections or regular ongoing therapy. Now you would think that this landmark study in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, which is an orthopedic journal, would be enough to convince some people that surgery can be at least considered as an option. However, Again, physiatrists, neurologists typically don't read this journal. So that brings us to Richard, 52 years old. And now you can see he's under general anesthesia and this is what his arm looks like. His elbow is tight, his wrist is in flexion and he has this odd sort of hyper extension of his metacarpal phalangeal joints and flexion of his IP joints. So the current state of the art that we can offer Richard is therapy and splinting Botox injections, tendon muscle releases, tendon transfers, and joint fusions. This slide was provided to me by Wing Dong Shu from Shanghai, and it has a really nice summary of surgical treatment, uh, Botox treatment, and rehabilitation, and what each of those limbs uh, really can offer. In this study, the preferred options and evidence for upper limb surgery for spasticity and cerebral palsy, stroke, and brain injury Anne Van Haste, as a senior author, does a very nice job of really putting together what has been the state of the art up until uh, recently. 
So under the current paradigm, what would we offer Richard? We'd offer him a shoulder surgery with maybe pectoralis latissimus, uh, major subscapularis lengthening to correct his internal rotation contracture. At the elbow, we would consider a brachialis or brachioradialis and biceps lengthening. In the forearm, pronator teres rerouting. In the wrist, FCU to ECRB transfer, FCU, FCR lengthening, and maybe a wrist fusion. For the fingers, FDS, FDP lengthening, and most likely in his case, it would be a superficialis to profundus transfer, which gives you no function. And in the thumb, thenars and adductor lengthening, so-called Metev procedure, as well as an FPL lengthening. And under this paradigm, what would Richard get? In the elbow, biceps, Z-lengthening, brachialis, fractional lengthening, and brachialis myotomy would improve his contracture. Forearm pronation would be improved by pronator teres, stenotomy, and rerouting, and wrist flexion with PRC and wrist fusion. Finger and thumb flexion would be corrected with STP transfer versus fractional lengthening, although in his case, most likely STP transfers, as well as FPL lengthening and the Metev release. Results of the traditional plan would be elbow extension range would be improved, spasticity would still be present, forearm would be a neutral, wrist fused and neutral, and really no hand function to speak of. And what I challenge all of us, is this all we can offer? And I, I'm bringing Cole to Newcastle here in the sense that uh, I know that you feel the same way. So tendon and bony solutions for a nerve problem, is that really the answer? Serially poisoning a muscle, knowing that the effects are only temporary and eventually they will get immunity. Stretching a muscle once or twice a week that sits contracted 24 seven seems like a tall order. And Mitch Saruya has done a nice job of putting together sort of the latest and greatest in uh, thinking about um, what's coming up in upper extremity spasticity management in this paper. And what he really talks about is selective denervation and nerve transfers. But everything old is new again. The first denervation for spasticity was performed in 1887 by Lorenz, where he performed an abductor neurectomy. But it was a complete neurectomy and therefore a complete failure because when you take away an agonist, you end up unbalancing that joint to allow the antagonist to now pull unrestricted. So what is a denervation? Well, it's treating an upper motor neuron injury, which is spasticity, with a lower motor neuron injury, which gives you flaccidity. So hopefully you'll end up somewhere between a flaccid limb and a spastic limb. And the key is how do we balance and decide the amount of denervation that's required for this to work? The problem with denervation, again, complete denervation kills the muscle completely and it tips the balance of the agonist, the antagonist in the opposite direction. So we don't wanna do that. So how does partial denervation work and how could this work? Well, in order to understand this, we have to go back to the basics of nerve physiology. Well, in order to understand this, we have to understand what makes up a nerve. Cervical spinal roots are about five to 10% efferent motor axons. That should be surprising to many people on this webinar. Motor nerves are 40 to 60% efferent motor axons, and there's lots of connective tissue. There are Schwann cells and myelin. Schwann cells are critical to nerve function. They really nurture the axons as they're passing along, and they provide support, not only in conduction, but also in maintaining the axon itself. When the axon is injured and malarian degeneration occurs, the Schwann cells no longer have anything to support, and they move into the endoneural tubes and can actually become a block to regeneration if they're left there with nothing to do for a very long time. Schwann cells also work to guide the axon, the blind runner in this case, across segments of injury. So a Schwann cell may be able to call and redirect an axon across a gap like this, but across a gap like this, there's no chance. And I think we need to relook at the Sunderland classification, which we all know this uh, neuropraxia from which we would expect full recovery, axon mesis from which generally speaking, you can expect near full to full recovery, and then three types of neurotmesis with preservation of the perineurium, preservation of the epineurium, or complete disruption as being the most severe. Now, what does this mean? 
I borrowed this slide from Johnny Elfar, and it gives you sort of a depiction of what we're talking about with demyelination and then progressive structural damage of the nerve as you first lose the endoneural tubes, then the perineurium, and then the epineurium itself. The clinical implications of this are that neuropraxia resolves completely around two months. Axon metric entries in, improve spontaneously by five months for the upper trunk and up to two years for the lower trunk in a brachial plexus injury. And this idea of one inch a month axonal growth cones. Neurotmesis, we've been told you can expect minimal or more delayed spontaneous recovery. And the results are generally better with surgical intervention. And you have these basically three neat and discrete categories at least that's what we've been told. But in reality, the degree of injury doesn't look like this at all. Neuromesis, axonmesis, and neuropraxia are, in my mind, completely flawed terms. They are oversimplifications of what's happening on a microscopic level. And we really need to think of what's happening on the micro level to better understand what is going on with that nerve. And so I think instead, it's better to think of the percentage of intact versus non-intact axons what's been referred to as axotomy, and then the percent demyelination of intact axons or percent demyelination, and the percent of intact macro and microstructure, how many endoneural tubes are preserved, and if they're damaged, how far away are they from each other so that an axon could, in theory, make it across. Disruption of the endoneural tubes is not an all or nothing phenomenon. And here are the tubes, generally speaking, a nerve is going to tear like this. It's not going to go all at once. And so the concept of all at once denervation, all at once axonomy, and all at once structural damage seems a little bit silly. Schematically, it looks something like this. The blue will have demyelination, later comes axonomy, and then later comes structural damage. But along any degree of strain, you can see that you can have some degree of all three of these types of damage occurring simultaneously. So how does recovery occur? Recovery occurs by remyelination of intact axons initially. As myelin is very sensitive to stretch and the injury results in Schwann cell resorption of the myelin itself, the Schwann cells remyelinate the bare axons thereafter. So the Schwann cells not only maintain the axons, but once the myelin is uh, disrupted, they actually help to absorb the myelin and then remyelinate. And the process is complete by about two months. For axotomy, the recovery is more complicated. Three to four weeks after injury, Wallerian degeneration is complete. Now, why do you need Wallerian degeneration? You need Wallerian degeneration because you want your Schwann cells to degrade all of that myelin and to degrade all of the factors that are keeping other axons out of that endoneural tube. Certainly is no room for more than one axon per endoneural tube, and you would not want multiple axons in there. And so there are factors uh, that inhibit nerve regrowth that have to be cleaned out via Wallerian degeneration before the axon can grow across. Proximal Schwann cells cross the injury site, and the axons begin to grow out at first a few in the first 10 days, and they don't have any directional bias. They some go proximal, some go distal. As long as the endoneural tube is empty and they can find one, they will take it. And there's no functional bias initially. That begins to change over the first month or two. So what happens is these growing axons then grow out to their target. There's minimal function at first, as only a few muscle fibers contract. Then what happens is the motor units expand, and I'll get more into that. And then strength recovers. Timing is proportional to the distance traveled, and timing is affected by age and comorbidities. But what's really happening that's fascinating, and I think has changed my view of how nerves recovery, is this concept of motor unit expansion. So what is a motor unit? A motor unit is one axon, and up to several hundred muscle fibers that are distributed fairly widely throughout the cross-section of a muscle. A normally innervated muscle will have only four to six muscle fibers of a particular motor unit that are typically within the pickup range of an EMG needle. 
Each of these normal motor units when activated will have an amplitude of just under two millivolts or with about a five to 10 millisecond duration. Partial denervation after terminal sprouting is completed leads to amplitudes of up to 20 millivolts with 20 to 30 millisecond durations. Those are these big spikes you see on the EMG. Larger amplitudes suggest that some actons, axons can expand to control five to 10 times as many muscle fibers within the range of the EMG needle compared to what they did prior to the injury. And so what you'll see is fewer axons take on the role of the previous axons by sprouting both terminally and between the nodes. And it looks something like this schematically. You have, for example, these three myelinated axons. One of them undergoes volantin degeneration, and that axonomized axon then is no longer able to innervate that single muscle fiber. The perisynaptic Schwann cells then search for viable axons in the neighborhood, and they recruit new axons or they recruit new sprouts into these denervated muscle fibers. So you have these remaining myelinated axons, but the perisynaptic Schwann cells guide the sprouting nerve to the neuromuscular junction, thus re innervating the muscle fiber. And these processes are all occurring simultaneously. Remyelination typically takes about two months. While remyelinating is occurring, the exotomized axons proximally are growing out from the injury site. This is, of course, age dependent, both in the speed and the rate. It's microstructure dependent, as we discussed. And these axons are remyelinating as they grow out. In the meantime, also, intact axons are undergoing terminal and nodal sprouting. The intact axons that are already at their target can expand within their target muscle to cover five times the normal muscle fibers. That process takes approximately two to three months. And therefore, an 80% axotomy can completely recover muscle function by four to five months. And then lastly, you have recovery of cortical control. If the axons are returned to their original targets, then there's no cortical plasticity required. However, that's unlikely. Cortical reorientation is required if the endoneural tubes are misaligned and some of the axons end up in muscles or in targets where they're not supposed to be. This process can take months and it is age dependent. The younger you are, the more uh, quickly and completely you can reorient your cortical orientation. And then there's cortical pruning and reassignment also that has to occur. For cortical misorientation, some patients never recover independent muscle cortical control. Co-contraction of the biceps and triceps is common, for example, in brachial plexus injuries. And there's essentially this mass firing of nerve roots where everything is getting jumbled up together and the axons are not ending up where they had been before and your homunculus gets very complicated. Botox of the antagonist sometimes can reboot the system. The muscle also takes a hit when it's denervated. Denervated muscle atrophies and takes months to years to recover maximum strength after re -innervation. And re is usually incomplete. The motor units from a re are usually larger and there are fewer of them, again, because of terminal nodal sprouting. And there's a loss or diminution of sympathetics which support the muscle function. The afferent axons cannot multiply to cover multiple sensory organelles, and the afferent feedback organelles may actually be stunted themselves. So what we're looking for with denervation is to interrupt the reflex arc. The afferent muscle axons cannot expand to cover additional sensory organelles like efferent motor axons. And therefore, there's a loss of reflex arc proportional to the loss of afferent axons. The efferent motor axons can multiply to cover five times the normal muscle fibers. And you can lose 80% of your motor axons without any loss of strength. Therefore, if you cut somewhere between half to 80% of a motor nerve, you can reduce spasticity again without losing strength. So where did this come from? Adolf Stoffel was born in Germany in 1880, and he studied at the Anatomical Institute at the University of Heidelberg. Stoffel spent most of his career working on the central nervous system and the distribution of nerve tracts within the spinal cord, connection of descending tracts to the peripheral nerves and the role of CNS in spasticity. Although he began his career as an orthopedic surgeon, he really continued his research into peripheral nerve and fascicular and topographical anatomy 
and even developed a nerve stimulator. And then in 1913 came this landmark article, The Treatment of Spastic Contractions. It introduced the concept of selective denervation for the management of spasticity. And in it, he has the following words. The treatment of spastic contractures presents one of the most difficult problems known to modern orthopedic surgery. Again, this was 1913. According to my opinion, we should refuse to be satisfied with the defective results accomplished by tendon operations in cases of spastic contractures and should strive to advance and to substitute new and better methods for the old, which have already too long dragged on a mere existence. And I do believe that operations on the nervous system mean a step in advance. Now this was 1913, we're now in 2021. I think Stoffel would be very disappointed with the progress that we have made over the last century. In his textbook published in 1913 with Oscar Volpius, his mentor, he talks about these techniques as well. But then unfortunately, World War I broke out in 1914 and the book was never translated into English. I actually have a copy of this book but it's in German, so I can't read it. But nonetheless, I felt like I should have it since he's such a visionary in the world of nerve surgery. He died before World War II in 1937, and much of his work was lost to history. It was picked up for a brief period in the US, and here the selective denervation became known as the Stoffel operation, but the details of the surgical technique were lost and the results uh, therefore suffered. Until Brunelli and Brunelli, now, this is articles from 1983 talking about partial selective denervation in spastic palsies, which they called hyponeurotization. And the concept was this. If you cut some axons, the other axons will sprout and will recover muscle function, which is exactly what we've been talking about. Now, where do you do this denervation? Because it may actually matter. There is neurotomy where you cut the whole nerve. There is a motor neurotomy. There are total motor neurotomies and partial motor neurotomies and selective and hyperselective and probably hyper hyperselective and not so selective. So there are reasons to do one or the other. Carolyn Leclerc in Paris has done a lot of work on the anatomy of the innervation of the muscles of the upper limb with an eye towards selective neurectomy. And she has advocated for hyperselective neurectomy based on this. Axons are supposed to be widely distributed throughout the muscle. They really are regionally specific. And therefore, the further you go into a muscle and undergo selective denervation, the less likely you are to innervate large swaths of that muscle. So let's go back to Richard. So Richard's surgical plan, according to the new paradigm, for the elbow, selective denervation of the biceps and the brachialis. For the forearm, pronation, flexor pronator slide should take care of that, as well as pronator, select, pronator teri selective denervation. For wrist flexion, flexor pronator slide and FCU, FCR selective denervation. For the finger and thumb flexion, flexor pronator slide again takes care of that. And we're gonna add an AIN selective denervation, which is somewhat controversial at this point. And this is what it, his arm looks like after a flexor pronator slide. And I'm not talking about the flexor pronator slide where you cut the, the flexor origin from the medial epicondyle. I'm talking about a full release of the entire flexor compartment. You can see the median nerve, you can see the ulnar nerve, and it's fairly easy to do the denervation. That's your biceps right there. So this is not a subtle operation. And again, here we are stimulating the median nerve to find the AIN fascicles, as well as the ulnar nerve. And this is Richard after surgery. And this is Richard before. And you can see a huge difference in the posture of his hand. And now he can walk down the street and people don't know that he has a problem. Here he is after selective denervation of his biceps. It's fairly easy for him to straighten his elbow compared to what it was before surgery. His hand function is very, very minimal, but that's a whole other topic. But because of the flexor pronator slide, we ended up in too much supination. Although look at his wrist, 
and his fingers overall. His MP hyperextension has turned into a really nice posture of his hand and his IP flexion has changed dramatically. So because of uh, the issues remaining, we decided to do step two. For his elbow, which still has a flexion contracture, we decided to do a fractional lengthening of his brachialis and a biceps lengthening as well. For his forearm supination problem, we decided to reroute his biceps while we were doing the lengthening, as well as a supinator selective denervation. For wrist flexion, we left that since that was looked great. Fingers were great, so we're not going to do anything to that. And for his thumb and palm, we would do a thenar adductor selective denervation and a brachioradialis to extensor pollicis brevis. Here's an example of selective denervation of the adductor and the thenars. Here is a diagram of the biceps rerouting. And here's Richard shortly after surgery. See a surgical dressing still on, but his flexion contracture is much improved as his, his supination contracture. And you can see the thumb is now nicely out of the palm. And what's interesting is he's starting to get some hand function. Now, that doesn't look like much, but it's something to somebody who had nothing. And remember, that's what he looked like. So there's an emerging paradigm now for managing spasticity. If there's spasticity without contracture, selective denervation is probably the answer, whether it's at the shoulder, the elbow, the forearm, wrist, fingers, or the thumb. If spasticity and contracture is an issue, then muscle tendon lengthening and selective denervation. To augment function, tendon transfers where muscles are expendable, controllable, and minimally spastic. But what do we do if there's no volitionally controlled muscles? Well, that's a bigger problem. Nerve transfers were also described by Adolf Stoffel. Transfer of the triceps to the axillary, and in fact, almost every nerve transfer that you can think of that we've been clever enough to devise over the last century, he had it all figured out by 2019 with diagrams, with a nerve stimulator, with specially designed um, nerve knives that you can see here. And the principle of nerve transfer is to replace a non-working nerve with another nerve that is volitionally controlled. Again, I got these slides from Wang Dong Xu in Shanghai, and uh, thank you, Dr. Xu, for these. But he's been pushing rewiring C7 for spastic hemiplegia with contralateral C7. This is Wang Dong Xu from my visit uh, to Shanghai. And really the concept is there's a new way to bypass the lesion by using the hemisphere that is controllable. And he reported on the results of this in a trial of contralateral seventh cervical nerve transfer for spastic arm paralysis in the New England Journal of Medicine which publishes the work of very few orthopedic surgeons. The research article about an original, as he called it, Chinese surgery. And here's some diagrams uh, from that study. And you can see this prevertebral root that usually allows a primary coaptation of the C7 to the other C7. Now, at the time that he gave me these slides, he had done about 200 patients. He's now done well over 400 patients from the last time I talked to him a few months ago. And that's a lot of patients and a lot of results. He uses the Fugelmeyer as a primary assessment. And you can see vast improvements in the surgery group versus the control group in terms of spasticity and function. It was statistically significant for stroke and cerebral palsy, but not for traumatic brain injury. But I think you can see the differences are about the same. So I think right now we have so much more to learn about spasticity, but the majority of the work was done for us back in 1913 by Adolf Stoffel, and hopefully we can pick it up where he left off. Also, there's more information on spasticity in littlearms.org. That's www.littlearms.org. That's our website. And you can look under Little Arms University for technique videos and also for patient informational videos. Thank you so much.